Good morning. Good morning. I get to do this this morning. <laughs> All right. uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Josh Kamaka Viva Ole. I'm one of the deacons here at Potomac Hills, and we're very happy to have you here today. Um, there are going to be a bunch of announcements behind me. I'm not going to talk about any of them, but you should read them. All right. What I am going to talk to you about is we are entering the summer. And like all summers except for last summer, we have a lot of moves coming up. And the deacons, as great and as awesome as we think we are at everything except volleyball, cannot do it ourselves. So we need you to help out. This is not a guys only thing, this is an everybody thing. And just for kicks and grins, how many of you by a show of hands, I know we're Presbyterian and all, we don't do this, but how many of you by a show of hands have been moved by this church. Okay, keep your hands up if you've been moved more than once by this church. Okay, so there's a few of us. I've been moved no less than three times by the church. It is like the most stressful day of your life, besides maybe getting married, okay? And it is stressful for the people that we are moving uh, in our church. So this coming Thursday, we are meeting up at um, Alex Thompson's house to load up a pod. It is just a load and it will be in the evening. If you can make it, that would be great. I'm gonna put up a note today on Facebook. Please RSVP with it if you can. We've got another move coming up in a few weeks um, for, uh, we only need a few people, but a few people to help move a few things for um, Gloria Michael. So again, just a load up of a U-Haul and then she's sending it off with Kyle and Cassie. So. If you can make it to those things, we have a few other things that are still being scheduled and stuff. If you can make it, please let us know. Keep an eye out as well for additional moves that we have coming up. All right. Like I said, there are other things you should check out. There's a thing happening today, for example, so make sure you read that. Um, our call to worship this morning comes to us from Philippians chapter 2. I will read the bit for the uh, leader, y'all be the people. And here we go. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Pray with me, if you will. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us all here this morning and for the opportunity we have to not only worship you and praise you, but to learn more about you from your word. We ask your blessings on uh, both those who lead us in song and those who bring us the word, that you would bless their, their lips and that you would ready our hearts, Lord, to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, many of you might notice that my wife is over on that side and on this side. It's not because I, I did something wrong and she sent me over here, at least not that I know of. Um, but the person I like to call my Sunday better half, Eli Riss, is sick today. So please keep Eli in your prayers and uh, I get to meet uh, Eli. So let's uh, all stand up as we sing Salt and Light and just be gracious uh, for whatever happens.
morning again. So my son Bennett has a genetic mutation that has caused some speech delays. I'm not going to get into any of it, but it basically at now age three he struggles not only stringing words together, but actually making certain kinds of sounds. And when he tries to tell us what he needs, we get some mixture of broken words, sound effects, and charades. And if I'm being frank about it, more often than not, I say, show me, instead of, oh, you want, and whatever he's trying to convey. Not being able to communicate what you need or what you want or something that's important to you is something that, for most of us, if I had to take a guess, we can't even remember. Right? As far back as any of us can, we've all been able to tell other people, especially those that need us and who we need in return, exactly what we need, how we're feeling, or things that we're excited about. 
not being able to communicate with those around us is probably quite frustrating. We can all thank God, though, that this doesn't apply to prayer. Not because we've all memorized the right things to say, or even because praying itself is easy, but rather because we don't know how to communicate how we're feeling, or what we need, or what we want, adequately to the one that we're praying to. But it is a blessing that we have not one but two advocates on our behalf. The book of Romans tells us that the Spirit himself, who frankly gets far less face time than he actually deserves, makes intercession for us because we don't know what to pray for like we ought to. And we find in Hebrews that Jesus sits for all time, making intercession on our behalf continually. Even when we can't speak for ourselves, our deepest needs are being communicated to God. We're going to pray today through uh, part of the second half of Psalm 109 today, where David spends quite a bit of time pouring out his soul to God during a time of incredible stress and strain, something that we all probably can relate to. While I'm reading, please try your best to put aside everything else that's filling your mind today and focus instead on just how much God cares about you by advocating for you all day long. And thank him for that. We're going to be praying as we have been through a bit of liturgy. And when we get to the pastoral prayer, we'll be going through Psalm 109. So uh, we'll all be reading the bolded parts together. um, And then I'll be reading the other bits. So get here in the Zoom. And there we are. All right, so reading together. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Sovereign God, we pray on behalf of your church throughout the world, for this congregation, and for those who serve and represent the Presbyterian Church in America around the world in the hard work of reaching others with the gospel. Today we pray for our missionaries, uh, Satoshi and Kali Kawachi of MTW Enterprise, who labor among the vast Muslim population in Europe. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and bless their ministry in person and online. Lord, over all missionary endeavors, hear our prayer. O Lord our God, in accordance with Romans 12, our text for today, we think of the great story of grace that you have revealed to us in Christ, and we give ourselves again to you. Teach us how to be your people, members of one another within the glorious body of Christ. Lord, who is the head of the church, hear our prayer. Lord, you are the rock that we can build upon, the fortress around us, and the shield before us. We may see you in the details of, uh, may we see you in the details of our lives today. May we glorify you, bear witness to our Savior, and be filled with the Holy Spirit in our thoughts, words, and deeds on this day. O Lord, our rock and our shield, hear our prayer. Lord, may your church be known as a people who love you, serve you, and work towards healing and renewal in every way. May the church be marked by your generous justice and deep mercy. Jesus, we give you all these prayers and lift them up to you. Pray with me if you would. Heavenly Father, we are once again so thankful to be in your presence and we thank you for the help that you provide us even when we don't know how to ask you O oh, oh god our lord deal on our behalf for your name's sake because your steadfast love is good for we are poor and needy and our hearts are, stri- are stricken within us help us O oh lord our god and save us according to your steadfast love let them know that this is your hand, 
You, O Lord, have done it. Let others curse, but you will bless. They arise and are put to shame, but your servant will be glad. With our mouths, we give great thanks to you, Lord, and we praise you in the midst of the throng. For you stand at the right hand of the needy one and save him from those who condemn his soul to death. We thank you, Lord, for pleading on our behalf when we cannot. And we thank you most especially for Jesus, without whose sacrifice we would be hopelessly lost. Take a moment to confess your own needs privately to the Lord. Let's join together then. O oh God, all of these spoken requests and all of our unspoken requests, we present to you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Holy Lord, we are guilty of pride and unbelief, of failure to find your mind in your word, to neglect to seek you in our daily lives. Our violations and shortcomings present our consciences with a long list of accusations, but they shall not stand, for we lay them all now on Christ, our sacrifice and advocate. Amen. And who is this mediator, true God, and at the same time truly human and truly righteous? Our Lord Jesus Christ, who was given us to set us completely free and to make us right with God. singing a song today that I sent out earlier in the week through the realm and Facebook called Sing Praise to Him. Um, because this is our family Sunday, it's a little different song, and I'm hoping that the, the youth will kind of lead us in this. But um, if you don't know the words, if you didn't, didn't watch that video or, or get familiar with it, then just make sure it's uh, something that's going through your mind as we were singing it, you can kind of pray it in your heart. But let's rise up for Sing Praise to Him. It's good to see everybody. Can you hear me? I turn on my mic. Now you can hear me? No? We'll keep trying. 
And while we're trying, turn to Romans 12. We're going to read verses 9 through 18. It is Family Sunday, so we've got lots of kids here, uh, hence uh, a story about cookies, um, chosen specially for this day. Not that I don't particularly enjoy cookies as well. But let's turn to our text for today, which is Romans 12. We're starting a new series on the one and other commands of the New Testament. We'll be doing this this summer, uh, so we have uh, 12 or 13 of these. Um, just in the epistles, there's over 30. There's about 60 throughout the whole Bible, although there's a number that are repeated. Uh, the Love One Another Command, which is next week's sermon, actually appears about 10 times in the New Testament. Um, so, turn to Romans 12. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is your word and we need it this day more than yesterday. Thank you for giving us the scriptures and making us your people. Lord, today we come to the first of many one another commands and they sound so easy. And yet we know they're easier said than done. So we pray that we would take them seriously, learn their lessons carefully, and follow the one who enables us to obey them thoroughly. Thank you that today we're learning from the Apostle Paul. Help us to hear his words, understand them, believe them, and obey them, and in so doing, demonstrate our love and affection for your church by outdoing one another and showing honor. And so we pray, speak through Romans 12 this Sunday morning. By the power of the Holy Spirit, help us see Jesus. For in his name we pray, amen and amen. I don't know how many of you have heard of the marshmallow test. Marshmallow test is a classic research project that illustrates our lack of self-control and our lack of uh, uh, being willing to delay gratification. So for the study, the researcher would give a child a marshmallow and tell them they could eat the marshmallow or they could wait until the researcher returned several minutes later, at which time they would get a second marshmallow. And videos abound on YouTube featuring kids and successive versions of the original experiment uh, waiting and mostly playing with and uh, then eating the first marshmallow and losing their chance at getting a second marshmallow. So in January 2020, the results of a new version of this experiment were released. And in this new version, kids were paired up and they played a game together. And then they were sent into a room and given a cookie with the promise of another cookie if they could wait for it by not eating the first cookie. However, some of the kids were put into a different uh, room in what the researchers called an interdependent situation in which they were teamed up with another kid and told they would only get the second cookie if both they and their partner could wait for it and not eat the first cookie. And the results of the test showed that the kids 
who were teamed up and who depended on one another waited for the second cookie way more often, about three to four times more than the individual kids. And the researcher said in this study, the children were motivated to delay gratification because they felt they shouldn't let their partner down. And if they did, their partner would have the right to hold them accountable. I doubt the kids would use that terminology. So I was thinking if we need to depend on one another when it comes to getting cookies, then Romans 12 says we need to depend on one another when it comes to showing honor. If we can work together in getting cookies, then we can work together when it comes to showing honor. So our specific focus this morning is on the two commands in Romans 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection and outdo one another in showing honor. These commands are addressed to the church. The one another here does not mean everybody everywhere, although there are verses that say that. But these commands right here in Romans 12 are specific to fellow believers in the church. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have affection for an unbeliever, you surely can. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't honor unbelievers, you surely should. But the focus here is on the church. Wherever else you have affection, have it here. And whomever else you honor, show honor here. So this leads to several questions. What is affection toward fellow believers? And what does it mean to honor each other? And why is this commanded? Why is it important? How do you experience it? And then there's even harder questions. How do you have affection for a believer you may not like? Or how do you honor believers who do dishonorable things? So let's start with the what of honor. If you've got the uh, uh, sermon outline, either printed out or following along online, that's your first blank, the what of honor. So what is affection and what is honor? Both of uh, the words we see at the beginning of verse 10, love and brotherly affection, are emotion-laden words. They immediately ruin that sort of stoic pseudo-Christian notion that we don't have to like people but we should love them. Of course it's true that you can love somebody you don't like. That is, you can do good things for them. You can help them and treat them respectfully, even if you're a little cold about it. But that's not the kind of love the Apostle Paul is talking about here. And there's two implications in these words. So the first word for love at the beginning of the verse is philostorge. And that means that's the sort of comfortable at-homeness you feel when you put on your favorite t-shirt or you sit with an old dog, or you fall into that easy chair that your body has molded for the last 10 years, or having a friend that you feel so easy with, there's not the slightest worry about having to keep the conversation going or getting through those calming times of silence. Now, the second word, brotherly affection, is Philadelphia, like the city, and it's just what it says. It's the affection in a family that comes with long familiarity and deep bonds. Now, of course, if your family's anything like mine, uh, you can have squabbles and you can get mad. But let some bully pick on your little sister and family affection shows a whole new side. Or let one of the family members get a life-threatening sickness or suddenly pass away and there's a kind of tears that don't come for others. And all of this is to say that's what it's, the kind of affection we're supposed to have for each other in the church. Now I know there's some people that are saying, that's too hard. I can't do that. There are too many weirdos and goofballs and emotional misfits in the church. Okay, for the sake of argument, we'll say you're right. 
So what? Since when are the commands of God supposed to be doable in your own strength? You know, Matthew 19, with man this is impossible, with God all things are possible. Besides, how do you know those people aren't talking about you? So what about showing honor? Verse 10 says, outdo one another in showing honor. What is that? Honor is different than affection. You can honor a person for whom you have no affection. Paul doesn't want you to choose between these two things. He wants you to do both, but they are very different. Honoring someone is treating them with your words and actions as worthy of your service. They may not be worthy of it, but you do it anyway. You're treating them as if they are worthy of your service. So honoring often means treating people better than they deserve. For example, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, let all who are under a yoke as a bond servant regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. So they may be scoundrels, but you're to regard them as worthy of honor, not because they deserve it, but for the honor of Christ. You count them worthy the way God counts you righteous. You count them worthy the way God counts you righteous. Now that doesn't mean you don't see their faults, but you act and speak in such a way as to honor them. Another example we have is in 1 Corinthians. Paul gives a comparison between weak members of the church and certain parts of the human body. 1 Corinthians 12, on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. So showing honor is not always a response to something or someone being honorable. So what does it mean then to outdo one another in showing honor? I actually wrestle with that. What does outdoing one another look like? Is this a competition? And I don't think so, unless it's an internal competition. I think it boils down to the sense that you prefer to honor others rather than to be honored yourself. You prefer to honor others rather than to be honored yourself. Now, if you try to out-honor someone, it means that you love to honor others more than you love to be honored. You enjoy elevating others to a position of honor more than you enjoy being elevated to a position of honor yourself. So we're not to be giving energy to how we can be honored, but how we can honor others. We're to put to death that craving for honor and to cultivate the love of honoring others. Now this comes with a caveat, and it's later in our Romans 12 passage, but more extensively in the book of James, and that's beware of honoring only one kind of person. One race, one socioeconomic class, or one educational level, or one sex, or one age, or one way of dressing, or one body weight, or one personality. The Bible's pretty clear that God gets angry when he sees this kind of dishonoring in the church. And James shows us the kind of failure to honor that displeases the Lord. So in James chapter 2, at the very beginning, he says, My brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? which he promised to those who love him, but you have dishonored the poor man. So let us prefer to be, to uh, honor more than we prefer to be honored, but we need to beware of doing it with partiality. 
So now why is this important? What difference does it make for us to know the why of honor? That's sort of the what of honor. What about the why? Why does it matter that we have affection for each other and that we prefer to honor each other? <coughs> Basically, I'm assuming it matters because the Bible says it matters. So that's the first thing. Um, you know, it matters because the Bible says so. That's sort of your sort of very basic answer, but I'm not going to leave it there. We are going to seek to get into the mind of Christ as revealed in Scripture in order to understand why he commands affection and honor. Now, first, God commands that we love with affection and honor each other because these two experiences, along with all those others listed in Romans 12, show the reality of our new nature in Christ. In other words, these are behaviors that are natural and fitting for those who are born again and are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and are justified by faith and are treasuring Christ and are hoping in the glory of God. These are behaviors that are fitting and natural and proper. They become like fruit. Affection is natural because the new birth means we're all born into the same family. We have one father and we're all brothers and sisters. First John 5 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the father loves whoever has been born of him. In other words, love for the father shows itself in love for the children. Affection for God brings affection for his children. We will spend eternity with each other in the sweetest possible relationships. Think about that. There'll be no suspicion, no animosity, no resentment, no bitterness, no disapproval in heaven. And God is commanding us to live in light of that reality here and now. Now, the preference to honor, more th to honor others more than to be honored is also a demonstration that we've been so incredibly honored by God, and now his spirit dwells within us. And if you think about that, it's pretty amazing. Generally, we are not honorable in relation to God. We are infinitely dishonorable to God in ourselves. We have brought great discredit on God for how little we love him, and how much we prefer other things to him. As John Calvin once said, our hearts are idol factories. Nevertheless, God has given his son on our behalf while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 6, and while we were yet dishonoring him, and he honored us by rescuing us from sin and death and hell and Satan and by giving us a place at his table. And beyond all comprehension, the sovereign Son of God not only honors us by washing our feet while he was here on earth, John 13, but in Luke 12, it pictures the second coming of Christ coming like this. It says, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. Christ so honors us, not just that he served his followers in the past, but he is going to serve his followers again. That's pretty remarkable if you think about it. Christ is going to come back, and he's going to do a whole lot of things. If you've been uh, listening to Revelation, you know there's a whole lot of really, really big things coming. But when that's settled, one of the things he's going to do is serve his people. We have been so immeasurably honored by God's mercy that not to prefer to honor as we have been honored is essentially to betray that we really don't understand how great our salvation really is. Loving with affection and preferring to honor one another 
are important because they show our new nature in Christ. It's the way children of God are supposed to treat each other. It's part of our spiritual DNA. So that, that's the first thing. We love with brotherly affection and we outdo one another in honor because we're Christians, because we follow Jesus. It's part of who we are. Second, God demands that we love with affection and prefer to honor each other because this strengthens and confirms the faith of those that we're showing affection to and showing honor to. When you're on the receiving end of affection and this merciful honor in the body of Christ, you experience the confirmation that you're indeed in the family. God means for all things to be done for the building up of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 14. And loving with affection and preferring to honor others are effective ways of building up the faith of others. Third, God demands that we love with affection and prefer to honor others over being honored ourselves because this displays the glory of Christ. As he's the one who enables us to live like that. This is a portrait of his own character. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. The tenderness of our relations is rooted in the tenderness of Christ. And when we elevate someone by becoming their servant, we're painting a picture of the way Christ served among us. So brotherly affection and showing honor displays the character of Christ. Fourth, God demands that we love with affection and honor one another because this is an effective means of persuading the world to love him and receive all that he has for them and all that he is for them in Christ. When you magnify Christ by outdoing one another and showing honor, the world's going to see that. And the Bible says that your friends and neighbors will be more inclined to glorify God. Matthew 5, in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, the remarkable growth of the early church in the Roman Empire happened in large part because of the kind of community they created. These networks of uh, loyal, humble, affectionate, respectful, sacrificial relationships. The fearful and fragmented pagans saw that and they were drawn to Christ because of it. In other words, there are reasons why Paul commands us to love each other with affection and outdo one another in showing honor. These things are not like Christmas tree ornaments on the tree of faith. They are fruit on the tree of faith. They come about naturally from abiding in Christ. Affection and honor come out of the very nature of who we are in Christ. So it's good to know what this means and it's good to know why it matters, but the reality is it's still easier said than done. And that brings us to the how of honor. Finally, the how question. How do you have affection for a believer you don't like? How do you honor a believer who may have done something dishonorable? Now the reality is everything in the Bible is written to answer these questions. Everything we preach is aimed to answer these questions because every sermon every week is designed to help you love Jesus more. And as we love Jesus more, we love those who love Jesus more. It's the point of 1 John 4, 19 to 21. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Because everything God does, he does to make his children who we ought to be. People who love Jesus more and people who love those who love Jesus more. So receive everything from God as a means of grace to make you love with affection and to honor others. 
So let me draw out a few practical things. Uh, the most basic, I'll just sum up all together here. To become the kind of person who loves believers with affection and prefers to show honor rather than get honor, you need to know that God commanded this. You need to know these things belong to the very nature of who we are in Christ. They're fruit, not ornaments. And you need to admit that you can't be this kind of person without the Holy Spirit enabling you. We don't create real affection and honor on our own. And therefore, we need to pray that God would do whatever he has to do to make you more and more into this kind of a affectionate and honoring person. Those are sort of the biblical basics. Practically, I would add that first, we have to preach to ourselves that other believers, no matter how imperfect, are the children of God, our Heavenly Father. We have to tell ourselves the truth that your brothers and sisters in Christ are these people forever. We have to remind ourselves that Christ shed his blood for them, that they are forgiven for all the things about them that upset you. They're justified by faith alone. And we have to be careful that we're not claiming that doctrine and word and denying it with our actions. If God has clothed them with the righteousness of Christ, then I think it's incumbent on us as best as we can to see them as clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Yes, they do bad things. Yes, they have bad attitudes. Yes, they may be spiritually immature. Yes, you may find them annoying. And yes, I have thought all of those things too. Not about you, but you know, those other people. However, don't dishonor the blood of Christ that covers all our sin and all their sin. We're very quick to accept that truth, the blood of Christ covers our sin. We tend to be slower when it's about the blood of Christ covering your sin or their sin or his sin or her sin. We glorify Christ's finished work when we apply it to them and then let affection grow. And then we can look for ways to honor them. So not only do we need to remember who we are in Christ, we need to remember who all the other people are in Christ too. Second, we have to look for evidence of grace at work in their flawed lives. Every believer has evidence of God's grace working in their life. God is at work in every saint. Don't dishonor the work of God by always complaining about the works of the flesh. So we're to look for evidence of grace. This is what God is doing for you at the last judgment. He's going to gather up all the D's and F's in your life and burn them. Then he's going to spread out your C's and your B's and rejoice over the evidence of grace in your life. I don't think there will actually be that many A's and there are no A pluses. So do for others now what God will do for you then. Rejoice over every evidence of grace. When we see growth, you know, we may want to see a person do this, but they only get halfway. They still got halfway. Let's not be quick to criticize that they haven't gotten all the way yet. Let's do that for each other. Let the wideness of God's grace awaken more and more affection and move us to showing honor one to another. Third, we need to remember that we were once alienated from God and without hope. We were once where they are. Ephesians 2 says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You are undeserving of any affection and any honor but in Christ, God has given you both. 
Philippians 2.3, which we read as part of our responsive reading this morning. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. The Apostle Paul says that humility is the key to counting others as worthy of our service. Humility enables us to show honor. So never forget your undeserving position. It's the seed of showing honor for one another. And perhaps the most important answer to the question, how can I become this kind of person, is simply this. Wake up and realize and feel how precious God's mercy is to you personally. Remember how Romans 12 began. We didn't read this earlier, but if we go all the way back to verse 1, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Yes, by the mercies of God, we will love each other with brotherly affection. Yes, by the mercies of God, we will outdo one another in showing honor. When a person has been plucked from a sinking ship, everything looks precious, especially people. And how affectionate we are to the people on the shore when we have just been saved. Well, that's our true condition. We are servants who want to be kings. And then the true king came and became a servant. And he loved us and he honored us. We just need to wake up to that truth. We need to realize the depths of God's mercy. We need to feel the grace of God all the way down deep in our bones. And then when we do, our affection for God's people will grow and you will love to honor them. Again, it's much easier to say than to do. So perhaps we could use an example of showing honor. This is Rachel Barron's last Sunday with us before she moves to Missouri. It is also her birthday. And she has something she would like to read to you. So Rachel, why don't you come on up? not know me very well. I'm a bit of an introvert and I apologize for that. Um, my name is Rachel Behrens and I've been part of the Potomac Hills family since I was about five months old. I can't personally attest to the love Potomac Hills showed my family for our first few years here. I was a little too small <laughs> but my parents sang your praises. I was adored in the nursery. I even have photographic proof. And I took my first steps at another church family's home. Growing up, my sister and I interrupted our fair share of church services. And you always showed my thoroughly embarrassed parents lots of grace. I was the shy little girl with the golden ringlets that twirled up and down the aisles during worship. I have fond memories of reenacting Bible stories and making great friends, playing red light, green light, sorry, <laughs> and eating animal crackers in children's church. My whole family loved it here. And it wasn't too long after my parents became members that my dad had the privilege of serving as an elder here. He especially loved the opportunities he got sharing God's love with newer members of the congregation as an elder. I became an official member of the church at age 12 in 2015, and I learned a lot 
about my heart and my faith in the new members class. Potomac Hills was there for all of my family's ups and downs. But the following year, the church especially demonstrated the love of Christ to me and my family. On March 14th, 2016, at two in the morning, we were notified by the police that my dad had passed away during his business trip to New Zealand. Less than 30 minutes later, thank you, both Pastor Silverneal and Pastor Dorst were at our house for support. They made us food, sent us cards, and gave us hugs as you grieved with us. Personally, the loss of my father made me bitter and angry at the world. And at times, the only respite from the pain was that youth group. I was able to laugh, sing, and pray with people I felt safe with. And for a girl who wondered if she'd ever smile again, it meant the world to me. The beginning of prayer groups and youth group helped me make it through my most anxious moments during high school. I have always had problems with feeling alone in my struggles, but having friends pray for me even if for having friends pray for even my smallest of trials reminded me that God really does want us to lay all our cares and anxieties on him. Little did I know a global pandemic would test that realization. COVID, clo uh, COVID closed my high school three months before I was scheduled to graduate. I tried to brush it off and started preparing to go to college in New York at my father's alma mater that fall. In July, a month before I could move into my dorm, New York and Virginia established extensive travel restrictions, and I could no longer safely attend college in person. I was forced to take a gap year, and I was devastated. My home life was tumultuous, but it was where I had to stay. I felt listless, and I didn't know if I'd ever make it to college. Unfortunately, during this time, my grandma who I had seen healthy a year prior, caught COVID. She is staying in a nursing home in St. Charles, Missouri, and there was nothing I could do but pray and plead with God. And God answered the multitude of prayers. My grandma survived, and I started to realize that COVID was not only a test of faith and patience, but also a test of gratitude. Like many of you, before COVID, I took most of my daily activities for granted. I found myself missing things I never thought I would miss, like the sticky seats in a movie theater, crowds in a mall, and most of all, I missed a sense of community. In June, I was finally able to see some of you again. I cried the first day we made it back to in-person worship Despite the fact that all of our songs were muffled with face masks, the chorus of your voices shook me to my core. I took this church family and my own family for granted. And if it weren't for COVID, I would never have made that realization. I changed directions and I'm now going to college in Missouri. I'm moving there tomorrow. <laughs> to spend time with my family. I will get the opportunity to hug my grandma and hold her hand as I tell her I love her. I could not be more blessed. The past few years have been a struggle for me and especially my family, but now I can confidently say I'm heading off 
to share the love of God that all of you have instilled in me at college. And I am truly blessed to have been raised by such a loving church family. I can hardly express the overwhelming gratitude I have for Potomac Hills Presbyterian Church and your impact on my life and soul. But I thought it was at least worth reading this letter. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. pray for you, and then I'll pray for us. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for Rachel. Thank you for bringing her here. Thank you for her family, for her brother and her sister who are here to support her. Thank you for all that you have brought her through, and Lord, we pray for these next set of adventures as she heads off to college in Missouri. Lord, we thank you that she is an example of loving us with affection and of showing honor. And we pray she never forgets those lessons and they characterize her life this day and all days. Amen. I need one of these. Well, you all need prayer too, so let's pray again. Our Lord and our God, thank you. And once again, you have spoken to us by your Son. Open our eyes that we might see our sin and then see our Savior. We confess there are times when we fail to see your mercy in our lives. There are times when we fail to see your grace at work in the lives of others. And there are times we would much rather pursue honor than show honor. So thank you for the one who has mercy on people like us who don't deserve it. Thank you for the one who bears all our sin on the cross, the one who redeems us by his blood, shed for many for the remission of sins, turning his curse into our blessing for the salvation of our souls. Help us who have fled for refuge to the cross so that we might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And work in each of us this summer as we learn once again how to love each other with brotherly affection and how to outdo one another in showing honor. Teach us to respond with a greater trust in you and your word. And through these one another commands, draw us ever closer to the one who displays them perfectly your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's rise up as we sing our closing again. My Jesus, I love you.
Tomorrow I start teaching a course on worship at RTS and uh, I finish writing all the lecture notes. And I discovered I have three pages on how to give a benediction. <laughs> it's something that I have just done for 30 years. Uh, so receive this one. We open our eyes and we put out our hands to receive it. This is a blessing, a pronouncement, a prayer coming from God to you. He is putting his name on you and blessing you. And he tells you, live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. God bless you. I will see you in a few weeks.